Hello everyone, welcome to Form Trends and welcome to my design review of the Polestar 2. Polestar is a new electric brand owned by Volvo and by extension Geely, which owns Volvo as well as Lincoln Co., Lotus, Proton, LEBC. You get the idea. Polestar is positioned as a luxury brand, a notch above Volvo, which makes its chief competition Tesla and the German premium electric car models. But this is quite unique, especially the Polestar 2. But before we delve into that, here's a bit of history. Back in 2015, Volvo purchased Polestar, which was creating performance versions of its cars, like a contractor of sorts. Today's Lincoln Co. Cyan racing team is the former Polestar racing division. In 2016, Volvo came out with the 40.1 and 40.2 concepts, both of which signaled the upcoming 40 cluster of cars from the Swedish brand, and the first application of the compact modular architecture, CMA platform for short. The 40.1 became the XC40, a very successful compact SUV that I reviewed a few years ago. But the 40.2, well, that didn't really fit into the Volvo model lineup. It was different. According to the design team, they wanted to continue with the car, and the decision was made to spin it off into becoming the Polestar brand's second product. In that sense, the story closely matches that of the Polestar 1, which started life as the Volvo Concept Coupe in 2013, before being spun off into becoming the first vehicle from the new brand. But while Polestar 1 is a hybrid model, and that shares a lot of carryover parts from Volvo's 90 cluster series, particularly in the interior, the Polestar 2 is an all new crossover vehicle typology, blending the attributes of a sedan with those of an SUV. Let's start with the exterior. It's simple, yet elegant and robust. It's fitted with big wheels surrounded by cladding. In that regard, it's similar to the cross-country V60 and V90 models that Volvo builds. But there's more to it than that. The front end has a lot of character without being aggressive. The body-colored badge sits proudly on its bluff nose, and while the blacked-out grille element is arguably unnecessary, it does conceal the front camera nicely and adds a technical feel through the numerous little squares within it. It's also got a little recess, which is a nod to the P1800's concave oval grille. The Thor's hammer headlamps are familiar and linked to Volvo, but on the Polestar 2, the center DRL and turn signal protrudes out of the main housing to almost join the grille. This adds to the sense of width of the front, which is underscored by the horizontal lines that demarcate the bumper and the base of the hood. Now, beneath the bumper is another secondary grille opening as well as two triangular graphical elements that house the fog lamps at each corner. And these graphic elements are a big deal on this car. The fact that these are black on this snow white model face and the horizontal elements of this car really add to the character while subtracting visual weight. The profile is very unique. It's taller but not too tall, robust but not too big, and assertive but not aggressive. I particularly like the blacked out A-pillars, the chunky C-pillar treatment, and the steeply raked backlight, which gives a unique and dynamic character. There's a lot of interesting details. The subtle indentation above the wheel arches works to accentuate the arches even more, adding character to the fenders and anchoring the car around these 20 inch wheels. It's also accomplished within the stamping of the body rather than through another trim piece. Otherwise, the surfacing on the body side and all around the vehicle is full with sharp edges and volumes to kind of contrast that. The shoulder line is continuous, running all the way around the car through to the deck lid. It progressively accentuated as it travels rearward, becoming more undercut over the rear door and above the rear fender. Emphasizing the rear haunches enhances the car's performance quality, so it makes sense to do that here, even though the car is all-wheel drive and not rear-wheel drive. In the lower section of the doors, there's a rising feature line and a pronounced light catcher beneath it. Now, to continue down to the black sill, this disguises the weight and the height of the car quite well. And while we're on the subject of height, the Polestar 2 is only 30 millimeter taller than a Tesla Model 3. And while the Tesla Model 3 is longer and wider by 80 millimeters, 88 millimeters, and 95 millimeters, respectively. 
Like at the front, the rear is bold and characterful thanks largely to the unique lighting signature. The concave area encased within the tail lamp graphic is fitted with the body colored badge, while the lighting is a thin 3D element that stands proud from the surfaces. The horizontal lines emphasize the width of the car, while blacked out lower diffuser element subtracts visual weight yet again. The squared clamp light graphic gives the car a robust yet technical aesthetic, which also subtly communicates the propulsion system within, especially when you approach and leave the car. It's got this very cool Knight Rider-like welcome signature, another nod to the tech. The Polestar 2 features the first all-new interior for the brand, which is notable. It's minimalist without forgetting that there's an actual driver. There's a dedicated 12.3-inch screen for the speedometer and all driving information in front of the driver. The central 11-inch portrait is clear, simple, and intuitive. The IP consists of a single continuous line that encapsulates three slim tiers and this central mounted tunnel. Now, like the exterior, this emphasizes the width of the cabin. And it highlights the technology showpiece, which is this 11 inch screen at the center. Okay, so within the cabin, obviously everything is very nice. It feels good. You know, there's certain bits that let it down. For example, this element here, I don't understand. Uh, why is it so high? It doesn't need to be, it could have reached the top bottom of the screen rather it didn't need to go all the way up here it kind of gets in your way on the knee it's good to lean on I suppose with your arm should you choose to but you know, you've got an armrest back here um, and it just kind of feels a bit tinny it's not like the most quality aspect and if they wanted to have some sort of continuity off of the IP and have it flow all the way into the center console why have it be two separate pieces of course it's going to cost less to manufacture two separate pieces, but it just breaks that continuity and therefore there's really no need for it to be so high. Yes, it, you know, the technology within is certainly framed by these two uh, side uh, panels here, but in my opinion, it doesn't really need to be this high. But this recessed here, this floating panel is really a nice touch for an electric car weighing 2.1 tons. It makes it appear like it's floating. Uh, the lightweight gear shifter as well, which is illuminated on the inside, also give that impression of lightness. So there's also the 3D knurling on the volume control, which also would be on some of the applique. This, however, is black, black ash, they call it. And the backlit element of the IP as well makes it more like a, a high-end luxury hotel. And, um, you know, it's communicated actually through the sustainable materials as well. This charcoal weave tech interior, it's a vegan interior, so they call it, because the 3D knit fabric covering the seats is made of 100% recycled bulk PET bottles. The interior plastic are infused with cork waste products, and the carpet is derived from recycled fishing nets. So it's all very Scandinavian. And the cabin is more driver focused than the Tesla, but it's airy. Like these windows aren't little slits, you know, kids can actually see out of them and there's a lot of light. You know, another cool feature is this huge panoramic roof here at the top, um, which has a lit pole star symbol, which is kind of the like the symbol of the North Star. That's a nice touch. You can operate everything from this screen car status, locking, interior lights, exterior lights, everything here, right? The automatic wipers and all the rest. You can even power the car off just by hitting that button down there. And that's basically what you do. Otherwise, it does so automatically. You get into the car, you put it in, you put your foot on the brake and you put it in drive or reverse and the car operates, starts working automatically. When you get to your destination, you get out, the car shuts off on its own. So it's really a very convenient user experience. One of the coolest functions of this car has got to be this 360 look, uh, because basically if you put it in reverse, it tells you which way you're going. And then you can also see all sorts of obstacles that are around you. So there's a dog right now behind this car, um, which could potentially uh, impede my ability to move it. I think Polestar has done a very good job and I should say Volvo as well, because they use a lot of common components um, you know Volvo and Polestar they have the same engineering team 
but this is actually hidden. Uh, everything that you cannot see um, is shared, and that is great for economies of scale, creating a lot of different things, products uh, that share a lot of the same components. But as a from a design perspective, you wouldn't really know, and you can tell that this is a unique product. So designers, even though they work across both brands, have done a very good job making this stand out from the other um, models within the Polestar or the Volvo range, I should say. This vehicle has actually the batteries which are mounted here in the middle. It's kind of a T-shape. So there's batteries right here in what would normally be the transmission tunnel. So you're not giving away any space, particularly at the rear, where you know you, you would have some batteries taking up and occupying the uh, the space in the footwell which is not the case here so you don't need to worry about your knees basically being in your chest um, it's very useful being that this is an electric car sound plays a huge role and one of the things that um, i found to be quite unique and interesting is the turn signal sound that is different for every vehicle volvo has a very specific um, turn signal sound uh, first generation and second generation Range Rover also. So those sounds are kind of amplified in this silent experience. And one thing that kind of I found interesting, I don't know if you can hear it, but take a listen. So that sound essentially reminds me of a record skipping. If, if you're old enough to remember vinyl records, when they reach the end of the record, they would just keep going and that's essentially what it sounds like to me. Um, maybe it's, you know, a bit of tech and people don't have that reference, but to me, it kind of sounds like that. Another thing that's very interesting is the seatbelt chime, and every car has one. Um, this one is soothing, just like it is in Volvos. Um, it's really quite appealing, actually. Um, and it does get progressively louder if you fail to put your seatbelt on. So to avoid that, let's sort that out right now. Nonetheless, it's extremely simple and intuitive to operate. You don't need to do anything. It actually does everything itself, which is good and bad. The reason why it's bad, a couple of days ago, I charged up the car in the plug in my house. I wanted to top it up because I was getting ready to go on a long trip and I wanted to make sure there was enough power to get me there and back. So I plugged the car in left it about six hours charging off of the main power in my home, which takes a long time. And I left. Now in the morning when I came in and I got in the car, it actually read zero, like zero charge. I couldn't do anything. The car was completely immobile, stuck. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't get it into gear. I couldn't even roll it down the driveway if I wanted to go to another charge point. I tried all sorts of things until after about 15 to 20 minutes, the car snapped out of it and everything started working again and it showed the battery level at 100%. Unfortunately, I didn't have to go to a meeting. It was a Saturday. I didn't have to go to a meeting. I didn't have to go, um, you know, catch a flight or anything, but it was annoying. In a different scenario, it could have actually been quite scary. So there's that. The one thing about electric cars is that besides being silent, they're extremely quick. The Polestar 2 generates 300 kilowatts of power from two motors, which translates to 408 horsepower in ICE terms. But it's really torque that matters in the real world, and this has 480 pound foot of it available as soon as you stamp on the pedal. Because of that, it can go zero to 60 in 4.5 seconds. That's not too bad for a car that weighs 2.1 tons. This car is all wheel drive. The weight distribution is damn near perfect. It's a bit like 1% heavier on the front than the rear. So it's ideal. Uh, it's really quite agile. The steering is a bit on the light side, even in the firm setting, but that's certainly not a deal breaker. I know a lot of people that don't like uh, steering as heavy as I do. The brakes are powerful. The Brembo four piston calipers are amazing. And the one pedal action is pretty great too. I found myself using this feature quite a lot around town, though at the standard setting it can be quite jarring. The regenerative braking really grabs the car if you completely lift off the accelerator. 
fortunately the engineers have dialed in a little bit of limo stop action at the end to smooth it out. Now this car is fitted with the 5,000 pound performance pack, which includes gold Brembo brake calipers, larger front discs, gold valve caps, yellow seat belts. The performance pack also adds Olin adjustable dampers so you can tweak the ride setting to your liking. I haven't touched them, so I presume they're on the standard setting, which is quite firm actually. The 20 inch wheels are shot with 40 series rubber, so the ride is a bit on the stiff side, but I, I actually quite like it. Charging. Being that this is an electric car, I'd be remiss not to mention charging. I've driven electric vehicles in the past, but I've not lived with them over several days, so this was a learning experience for me. The claimed WLTP range on the performance pack version of the Polestar 2, I don't know if it differs at all between models, this is the one I have, is 292 miles from its 78 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now, that's not as good as the Tesla Model 3's 329 mile range from a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack, but, and that's also compounded by the fact that Tesla's supercharger network, which can charge between 150 kilowatts and 250 kilowatts, is vastly superior. Obviously, when you charge at a much higher voltage, that means it takes less time. The Polestar network can only reach 150 kilowatts, and the best that I could find were 50 kilowatt outlets, which took two hours to charge 33%. Another time, it took three hours to charge from 25 to full charge, which is 75%, that three hours. So there's very little consistency. On a regular wall socket in my house, uh, it took six hours to charge 11%. Basically, what I'm saying is there's, there's no consistency. Um, obviously, you'd expect that from your house, but not from the same wattage charger. I'm a bit confused by this car, if I'm honest, because whilst the exterior design is incredibly unique, everything about it is very premium feeling. It's a really fun driver's car as well. You can throw it around and it reacts and it's a lot of fun to drive and it's quick, of course. But I think what confuses me most is not the car itself, but the brand. Polestar is this electric luxury vehicle brand, and makes sense to start popping up brands all over the place in China because they were getting a lot of government grants, you know, people were giving them money to, to start this, and so it was no real out-of-pocket expense. But when you think about long-term, you know, strategy-wise, let's say, why start a new brand when you've got Volvo already that is nipping at the heels of the premium, established premium automakers for a good while? And like back in the day, you wouldn't cross shop a BMW or a Mercedes Benz with a Volvo, but I think people nowadays do. They've come up so far in, you know, relatively short amount of time, basically since Thomas Inglath took over. It's all communicated through design, it's incredibly well done. And it's definitely moved them way closer into the premium class. So even though perhaps they're a near luxury segment vehicle manufacturer, they could easily have created this vehicle. And when you think about it in the long term, every manufacturer is going to have to create electric vehicles. So what will make this brand stand apart from the Volvo brand other than the fact that it's new? Um, you know, the fact that it has no baggage, no history, could be seen as being very appealing um, for some people, and some buyers, some customers in certain markets. But I still think it could have been a Volvo product. There's a lot of crossover, a lot of carryover elements as well, like the switch gear, like, you know, the steering wheel for itself, for example, is if it weren't for the badge at the center here, it could be a Volvo steering wheel. Um, the IP screen, of course, certain things like these knurled buttons for the uh, for the volume control and over here on the uh, on the vents adjustment. All of this uh, is stuff that we've seen on Volvo products before. Um, and, you know, it's fine. Of course, economies of scale, you expect things to be shared and you expect it to be, um, you know, showing up in other models. When it's not visible, such as engineering uh, components and all of those things, it makes sense. Obviously, you're going to decrease cost, but the customer itself doesn't know that, you know, it's coming from this or that. Here, there's a bit too much crossover, in my opinion. It also is you know, not that it's a bad thing, obviously Volvo products are great, but I question therefore the brand. Um, you know, why when other products in your range are electrified? If we look at this product, for example, 
based on the CMA architecture. The XC40, as I mentioned, is also based on the CMA architecture. They have an all-electric XC40, which actually sells for more than this car. How does that make any sense? Volvo is meant to be the near premium brand. This is supposed to be the luxury premium brand. So, hmm, I don't really understand the positioning. And again, why not just make this a Volvo product? But anyway, that's not bashing on this car at all. This is a fantastic product. Um, but it does make me question the Volvo or the Polestar brand at all. With plans to end sales of petrol and diesel vehicles in the UK, Germany, Ireland, and the Netherlands by 2030, Norway will bring in a ban in 2025, and France has a 2040 ban in the pipeline. Electric vehicles will be the new way forward, quite literally, and in the not too distant future. Hopefully, the infrastructure will be ready for this when it comes. Until then, the Polestar 2 is a great foray into what is as yet still new technology, and I'm sure we'll see a lot of improvement in the coming years. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for joining me for this review of the Polestar 2. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like. If there's anything I haven't covered in this video that you'd like to know more about, Leave me a question in the comments section and I'll do my best to answer it. If you like what I'm doing with this channel, please do consider subscribing. Hit that notification bell so you're aware of when I upload a new video. And until then, take care and see you on the next one.